Watchmen is widely regarded as one of the greatest graphic novels ever created. Brought to life by Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons and John Higgins, this dystopian deconstruction of superheroes and the Cold War proved to be an enormous success upon its 1986 release. And ever since Watchmen first hit the shelves, the prospect of bringing its alternate history tale to the big screen always seemed to be in discussion. Yes, while Zack Snyder did give us a Watchmen movie in 2009, the notion of Watchmen being developed as a live-action feature film had actually been kicked around for a long time, with Brazil and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas director Terry Gilliam attached to the project for a number of years. So, in this video, we're going to do our own bit of alternate history and look at the rise and fall of Terry Gilliam's cancelled Watchmen movie. We'll look at the origins of the project at 20th Century Fox, the various treatments and screenplays which tried to bring this epic story to life, and the factors that ultimately led to the film's cancellation, and the factors that ultimately led to this version of the film never seeing the light of day. So, before we dive into the attempts to bring Watchmen to the big screen, I want to quickly go over the basic premise of the series, for those who might be unfamiliar. Watchmen was a 1986 12-issue series written by Alan Moore with art by Dave Gibbons, set in an alternate version of the 1980s, in a world where costume vigilantes existed and eventually became outlawed, with the story now following the now retired or underground heroes and their struggles with morality in the backdrop of an impending nuclear war. Originally pitched to DC Comics as a way to reinvent the characters of the now defunct Charlton Comics Company, Watchmen quickly became a sensation overnight, often being referred to as one of the all-time great graphic novels. It's no surprise, therefore, that the story caught the eye of Hollywood producers, with many seeking to turn Moore's dystopian comic into a live-action feature film. In August 1986, the Watchmen film rights were bought by producer Lawrence Gordon for 20th Century Fox, with Joel Silver being hired to serve as a lead producer on the film. Alan Moore was invited to submit a treatment for the film's script, but he unsurprisingly declined, leading to Sam Hamm, who would later go on to write both Tim Burton's 1989 Batman and its 1992 follow-up Batman Returns, to pen a new screenplay for Watchmen. Hamm, at this time a budding screenwriter, looking to carve out his name in the industry, had a monumental task ahead of him. Watchmen was a 338 pages with nine panels on each page graphic novel, meaning that in order to get the film down to a concise runtime, significant changes would have to be made. Ham's first draft submitted in 1988 changed a number of elements from the original graphic novel, namely removing the likes of Rorschach's narration and the entire Tales of the Black Freighter subplot, renaming the superhero team from the Crime Busters to the Watchmen and rewriting the entire third act of the story. The film would open with a flashback to 1976, where the Watchmen failed to stop a terrorist attack at the Statue of Liberty, an event which would cause the government's ban on masks and superheroes. We would then flash forward 10 years later, with Rorschach investigating the death of the comedian and meeting up with the former Night Owl to discuss the implications of their former colleague's death. Rorschach would also meet with Adrian Veidt, the former Ozymandias, and now a wealthy philanthropist, who takes the information and relays it to the other ex-Watchmen members, Dr. Manhattan and Silk Spectre, with the three theorising that whoever killed the comedian may also be out to get the other members of the team. Around this time, it's also established that a number of former colleagues of Dr. Manhattan had began to contract cancer, with Silk Spectre herself becoming concerned for her health due to the pair's ongoing relationship. Dr. Manhattan is confronted with these allegations while appearing on television, resulting in the former hero exiling himself to Mars. And with him gone, Silk Spectre eventually reconnects with Night Owl, and the pair begin a relationship, whilst Rorschach is framed for the murder of a former adversary and imprisoned. Night Owl and Silk Spectre do break Rorschach out of prison, and the trio, alongside a now returned Dr. Manhattan, reconvene at Ozymandias' base in Antarctica. There, it's revealed that Veidt had been behind the comedian's murder, Rorschach's framing and Silk Spectre's cancer scare, as the former hero unveils his master plan. And I think I'm gonna let Joel Silver, the film's producer, 
describe what would happen next. He stated, Instead of the whole notion of the intergalactic thing, which was too hard and too silly, what he did was he maintained that the existence of Dr. Manhattan had changed the whole balance of the world economy. He felt that that character really altered the way reality had been. He had the Ozymandias character convince, essentially, the Dr. Manhattan character to go back and stop himself from being created. So there never would be a Dr. Manhattan. He was the only character with real supernatural powers. He went back and prevented himself from being turned into Dr. Manhattan. And in the vortex that was created after that occurred, these characters from Watchmen only became characters in a comic book. So, yeah. Ham's conclusion to Watchmen would have ditched the entire giant squid element from the comic and instead see Ozymandias build a wormhole in space with the intention of using it to kill John Osterman before he became Dr. Manhattan and ultimately preventing the escalation of the Cold War to the point of nuclear annihilation. Veidt is vaporised by the machine as he attempts to flee from his former teammate before Dr. Manhattan decides to use it, travelling back to 1962 and preventing himself from being disintegrated and reformed as his godlike self, creating an alternate timeline where in the film's present day, America lost the Vietnam War, President Nixon was forced to resign after the Watergate scandal, and nuclear war is adverted. Rorschach, Night Owl and Silk Spectre watch on as they're transported into New York City, where they see that their former lives and memories now only exist in the pages of comics on a newsstand, entitled the Watchmen, as the costume trio look on confused as the film ends. After Ham's treatment was submitted to 20th Century Fox in 1988, momentum on the Watchmen film began to fluctuate. Initially, it seems as if the project was moving ahead fast, with a tentative 1991 release date set, and producer Lawrence Gordon setting up his production studio, Largo Entertainment, to produce the film while Fox would distribute it. However, by 1994, Gordon had quit Largo altogether and moved Watchmen over to Warner Brothers, where Terry Gilliam, who had recently directed the dystopian sci-fi film Brazil, was hired to helm the film. A second draft of Ham's screenplay was commissioned soon after, with the writer working alongside Warren Scarron and Charles McEwen to retune the film's script, with these rewrites adding in discarded comic book elements such as Rorschach's journal as the film's narration. And with the script now finished, it seemed like Watchmen was finally ready to step in front of cameras. According to Dave Gibbons, dates for shooting the film were arranged and scheduled at Pinewood Studios, while producer Joel Silver openly courted Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the role of Dr. Manhattan. However, the film's production quickly ran into a major problem. You see, in 1988, Terry Gilliam had directed The Adventures of Baron Munchausen for Columbia Pictures, with the film's budget ballooning to an estimated $46 million. Around this same time, Joel Silver had recently been responsible for producing Die Hard 2, a film which also saw its budget rise exponentially to around $70 million during production. For these reasons, although Warner Brothers were keen on bringing Watchmen to life, they were concerned about both Silver and Gilliam's ability to restrain the budget, causing the studio to only allocate $25 million to make the film, a quarter of what the producers had initially conceived. This slashing of the movie's budget ultimately saw Watchmen's production halt for a number of years, with Terry Gilliam eventually leaving the project altogether in November of 2000. Unable to make the movie that he'd envisaged, with significant changes required to both its scope and runtime, as a result of the reduced budget. With Gilliam stating that reducing the story to a two or a two and a half hour film seemed to me to take away the essence of what Watchmen is about. Without Gilliam, Warner Brothers eventually dropped Watchmen altogether, and much like its dark alternate history, the future seemed bleak for the prospects of this film ever actually being made. Gordon and Silver took the project to both Universal and Paramount in the subsequent years, and although directors such as Darren Aronofsky and Paul Greengrass became attached at various points, little progress was ever made on the film. Time and time again, Watchmen simply failed to enter production. Whether it was the scope, the nature of the story, or the studio's apprehension at the amount of money needed to make the film properly, Watchmen quickly became an infamous resident of Hollywood's development hell. 
with Terry Gilliam even going as far as to call the project itself unfilmable. Eventually though, Watchmen did make it to the big screen. In December 2005, the project returned to Warner Brothers, where the studio hired 300 director Zack Snyder to helm the film. Principal photography began in September 2007 on an estimated budget of $120 million, and Watchmen was finally released to the world in March of 2009. After a near 30 year struggle to film the unfilmable, it had finally been accomplished. Snyder's Watchmen film ultimately remained closer to the source material than the version conceived by Gilliam and Ham, with the latter's being a much less cynical and darker film and a number of massive changes to the identity and the core of what Watchmen as a graphic novel is. Famously, when Gilliam exited the project, he told Gordon and Silver that Watchmen could never be its true form in a film, instead recommending producing an episodic miniseries for television, and with HBO and Damon Lindelof's nine episode Watchmen series on the horizon, I find it interesting to look at the long and arduous history that Watchmen has had behind the scenes. Studios were trying to bring the story to life as early as the mid 1980s, and it's only within the last decade that it's actually become a reality. But the question remains, how different would things have been if Watchmen did indeed make its way onto the big screens in the 1990s? And how would it affect both the future adaptations of the story and also the wider future of live action comic book adaptations. I guess we'll never know for sure, but as Watchmen now makes its way onto television, I think it's worth keeping in mind the long and storied history that this franchise has had, and the many attempts to get an adaptation off the ground that would allow fans of this incredible comic book to have the opportunity to truly watch The Watchmen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on Terry Gilliam's cancelled Watchmen movie from the 1990s. Would you like to have seen it? And how different do you think it would have been to the film that we eventually got? And if you've seen the first episode of HBO's Watchmen series, let me know your thoughts on that as well. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please consider hitting the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with all the new videos we make. And there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. You can follow me on Twitter just at Owen Likes Comics. And that's all for me. I will see you all next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.